<laughs> Messed you all up early. Good morning. Oh, good. I have two off the books announcements that I want to make. And, uh, you know, captive audience to an Irishman is like, uh, you know, gasoline to a flame. So I feel sorry for you all. So the first one is, is that uh, Carissa and Stephen would like me to thank you all for your desire to uh, be at their wedding and to lament with them that the Westminster Church is not the size of, uh, of uh, you know, Wrig Wrigley Stadium, but uh, Wrigley Field, but instead they have a limited amount of space that they can utilize. Rotten Fire Marshal is keeping them uh, towed to the mark, and so if you did not get an invitation, it isn't because you're not loved. It's because they're stuck with the size they're stuck with. So anyway, humblest apologies for, uh, for not being able to go, for those of you that are not able to go. And the other thing is, is that it's going to be live stream. So it'll be like the COVID days when we're all locked in our homes. The other one that didn't make the announcements, but I'm going to bring it up to you because one of our congregations said, why don't you tell everybody about this? So I'm going to tell everybody. Uh, the deacons have partnered with a group called Forgotten Child. It is a uh, trafficked women's rescue organization. Uh, we are in the process of helping them uh, create a home for these young women. Uh, generally, they're rescued from, uh, actually, they were very active at the Super Bowl in Inglewood. And uh, these young women are generally in Los Angeles and uh, forced into the, uh, into the trade of prostitution. And they're generally captured from somewhere else in the country and brought here for that purpose. Forgotten Child rescues these young women as they're in need of, of help and, uh, and uh, a kind word, and they are taking them to a safe house uh, somewhere else. And uh, we are involved in providing them with expertise and funds to make the safe house a training facility. So these young women are being given a trade of uh, uh, actually uh, culinary skills, and a professional kitchen is being built in this home where they're being housed and uh, they will be retrained and then uh, given an opportunity to go somewhere else and start a new life. And uh, this, is, this is what your deacons are doing at this moment in time, uh, along with other stuff. It's individual things, people were helping. But uh, we, because today's the deacons offering, I thought it was kind of a good idea to uh, bring that stuff up so it just isn't you know, money in the plate and have no idea what happens to it. So praise God for how it is that he's helping our church help others. I got top billing as the guest pastor, which is kind of fun, but uh, I am your elder and uh, I'm here all the time. So, uh, but tonight is uh, Jimmy Apodaca from our uh, Cerritos Church and uh, also communion is happening tonight. And so if you can uh, come, it would be really a blessing to you and to the people here that are worshiping. Uh, uh, Mike has an announcement about adult Sunday school. There'll be some, uh, 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 stop and start of uh, the attributes of God. Tomorrow is July 4th and it is the picnic, which I was talking with Melanie, it's more like the Nelson family reunion, but uh, 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 none of us gets a chance to cut the meat because that's all dealt with by, by family. If, if you ain't blood, you don't, get to, you don't get a knife. So, but the rest of the stuff, you know, the uh, potluck stuff is really, uh, really neat to see and, and, uh, and sample. So if you can come, it's at uh, Valley Christian High School uh, tomorrow at 10 a.m. until the last, the last of the stragglers, until Uncle Mark throws us out and takes the tables. But other than that, it's supposed to be a really, we're supposed to have a really fun time and we're sitting under trees where it's shaded. And, uh, do y'all think about Ruth bringing her accordion to the 4th of July picnic and playing hymns for us? It was a, you know, we have a deep history, a rich, a rich history in this, in this church. And, uh, we should all remember how God has blessed us over all these years. What are we, 78 years now, I think, in existence? I think it's 78. Ladies' clothing swap. Uh, if you have uh, questions and or have, have received the, uh, the invitation, please RSVP or speak to Kaylin. Uh, we're also been, uh, part, we're gonna partner again with the American Red Cross and uh, part, be part of a blood drive on July 22. Uh, and if you have any questions about that, please see Abby. Uh, we're all going to go camping together again. Um, Mike, did you find a uh, preacher yet? 
So if anybody feels like bringing the word to the camp out, here's your big chance. Uh, we have no one to bring the word on Sunday at the camp out. But uh, anyway, it is, uh, it is at the end of the month, and, uh, and it's local. It's, it's, it's nearby in San Bernardino County. Uh, and uh, young adult Bible study at uh, uh, Rachel and Bertie's house. It's uh, doing really well. I don't know whether you know, but uh, Mary Ruth uh, launched this thing uh, really kind of for Rachel's benefit, and Rachel really wanted to start a Bible study. And so we have uh, several of our young men are teaching. I have never, never led a Bible study before, and I, they're, they're enjoying it, and it's going really well. And then uh, here at church on Thursdays, uh, uh, Steve, will, Steve Shibley will be hosting a, a Bible study for uh, uh, adults, which for those of us who never matured, it's always difficult to qualify. But. Also, uh, we have our monthly uh, prayer list. If you follow this and use it for your, uh, for your daily prayers, uh, this is a real benefit. So it's in your bulletin today. I'm sure you already saw it. Um, I did this backwards. It says welcome and announcements, and uh, I announced first, so welcome. Glad you could all be here. If you're a visitor, we would appreciate you filling out the card from the pew in front of you and either dropping in the offering and also signing our guest book in the back. We would love to contact you and, and uh, welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 75, verse 1 says, We give thanks to you, O God, we give thanks for your name is near. We recount your wondrous deeds. Let us open in prayer. Lord God, I thank you for your wondrous deeds. I pray, Lord, that as our hearts are here today, that our minds would stay here as well, that we would recount your wondrous deeds in song, in the word, in prayer, and that this day would bring glory to you because your people are here. Bless those that are not able to attend, guard their hearts and keep them safe. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would now stand so we could sing uh, Jesus, thank you.
take your red Trinity hymnals and turn to 307, please. We're doing day 27 of the Heidelberg Catechism. I will read the question, uh, both 72 through 74, and uh, you will uh, respond with the answer that's in the dark print. People of God, does this outward washing with water itself wash away sins? No, only Christ's blood and the Holy Spirit cleanses us from all sins. Why then does the Holy Spirit call baptism the water of rebirth, and the washing away of sins. God has a good reason for these words. To begin with, he wants to teach us that the blood and the Spirit of Christ take away our sins, just as water removes dirt from the body. But more importantly, he wants us to assure us by his divine pledge and sign that we are truly washed of our sins spiritually, and our bodies are washed of the water physically. Should infants also be baptized? Yes, infants as well as adults are included in God's covenant and people, and they, no less than adults, are promised deliverance from sin through Christ's blood and the Holy Spirit who works faith. Therefore, by baptism, the sign of the covenant, they too should be incorporated into the Christian church and distinguished from the children of unbelievers. This was done in the Old Testament by circumcision, which was replaced in the New Testament by baptism. Thank you. We'll now hear from the choir. Thank you. 
Thank you, choir. Let's pray together. Lord God, I thank you for your kindness to us, undeserved as we are. Father, there is uh, uh, amazing things that you do in our world that we are often dull to. But Lord God, I pray that you would bring to our hearts and our minds the beauty of what you do, the beauty of what you've done, the transcendent qualities of all that you are. Father, the fact that you see us from beginning to end and still choose to save us, we are truly grateful for the power that you exert in our world. I pray, Lord, that we would be more acquiescent to that power. Father God, I thank you for your kindness to those that are in need. I thank you for the blessing that you've given us as, as a congregation that we can worship together in peace, comfort, freedom. You, Lord, are the author of all of these things. And Lord, you are a master of all that is in the world today. And Father, we are your servants, and I pray that we would be able to serve you appropriately. Watch over the rest of our worship, Lord, and especially the word of God as it's brought from me and through your pow the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, that you would give us the ability to grasp and understand that which you would have us know for our growth. Father, I pray for our people as they work through this uh, difficult time in our society. Uh, everybody appears to be angry, God, and I pray that the people of God would bring peace to the world through their own uh, machinations with their neighbors, with their coworkers, with their fellow church members. Lord, that our love would be paramount in our hearts. The love that you give us to extend to others. Father, that you would give us both the grace and the sight to see those that need help, need care, need comfort. Father, that we might fulfill the part in Romans 12 that talks about weeping with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice, that that would be our goal. Starting this day, Lord, starting this hour, starting in this place, that we as your people would serve you through our kindness. Father, it is your kindness that leads us through repentance in Romans 2, and I pray, Lord, that we would also extend the kindness as an extension of what you've already given to us. 
Lord God, we are not a people that is good at our job. We're kind of confused as to why you even choose to use us, but here we are in the process of growing and being sanctified by the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray that we'd be far less resistant and far more able to do the job that you've given us to do. Lord God, I pray for our young people, that they would join together as people of God, that they would grow in their faith. Father, the future of the church is the young people in it. And I pray, Lord, that you would cause this church to continue by virtue of those that you bring here to worship. I pray for our various Bible studies, that they would both grow and nurture the people that are in them and bless the people that are providing them. And Father, I pray for this body here and the other bodies that we are associated with. Father, I pray today for Pastor Caleb as he preaches the word in Thousand Oaks. I thank you, Lord, for all the people that are wishing to join the church. I thank you for how you're causing it to grow through no great uh, amazing skill set on anybody's part, but on the fact that your Holy Spirit has called people to worship in that place. Father, give us a good time today to worship you. Cause our hearts to be lifted. Take us from the feelings of, uh, of doom to the feelings of glory as we know that you are a God who wishes his people to glorify him. Bless our offering today, Lord, that it would bring you uh, honor and glory and cause us all to give to you that which you've given to us. We thank you for these things and those that are unspoken. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Uh, ushers will take the offering, and junior church is dismissed at this time. If you could all stand and uh, sing with me hymn 564.
please be seated. So when James said he was taking a sabbatical early in the year, uh, I have uh, I started preparing this sermon for the eventuality that I might be called to preach. And uh, I'm glad it took so long, or I'm glad I started so far back, because uh, despite the fact that I actually put music to this song so that I could uh, memorize the words, uh, my understanding of, of what this said was not accurate. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't great. So in all this time, it's been months now, that I just keep going back to this. Um, as, as the blessings would, uh, would have it, uh, the way this has worked out is that James uh, got sick in May and I was called to come and preach in this pulpit and so I took part of a sermon that I had already prepared out of Romans, Living Sacrifice. And then I gave the rest of it, that was in May, in June I gave the rest of it to serve God in the faith he gives us. And then today we're going to talk about dangers lurking for the people of God. Because it's a dangerous world. If you've read the screw tape letters, you know that there is plenty of strategy and tactics going on around you in the unseen world to get you off target. The whole idea is to make you look. It's like, as my son calls it, illusion, where you make someone look over here while you're doing something sneaky over there. So what's the problem? Well, let me read the psalm and then we'll discuss the problem. We just sang the whole song, but I'll, I'll, I'll read it anyway. Uh, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. All right, so let's talk about um, danger. Danger is a teacher. <laughs> if you had a doting mom, her, her standard statement was, watch out, look out, don't do that. My wife is very careful with our grandchildren, and uh, she has rubber bumpers on the corners of all of the low-hanging tables because she can't imagine living through the fact that your child might, or one of, our, one of the children under our care, might damage themselves. Uh, other parents are free-range parents that allow their kids to you know, bang off everything and have plenty of Band-Aids and uh, ER on speed dial, and, and you know, there's, a, there's a training there that, that goes on when you learn about the dangers. The dangers in life. Look out. That's something wrong with that. Uh, I have told you the uh, anecdote before about crawling in a three-man search team in a house that was so black with smoke that you had to be on your hands and knees. And I was third in line. It looks like those uh, Disney pachyderm uh, uh, parades where the guy in back has a hold of the, the framework of the breather of the guy in front and the, guy next, and the next guy has the breather in front of him. And, off you go across the room. Well, the first guy disappeared. Second guy, being droll of wit, turns to me and says, hole. There was a hole in the floor large enough to swallow the guy in an 18-inch uh, crawl space. And he climbed back out. We made fun of him, and everybody went on. But what's the danger? The danger was there was, there was a hole there. So, you know, if, if more people crawled through, you say, watch out for the hole. If you're really worried about people's safety. I went to the Marriott Hotel for a fire in the grease, uh, the fry maker, the grease, grease uh, uh, boiler, and uh, foam 
was triggered and it came down into the grease fire and then it bubbled the grease over onto the tile floor. I was the first one in the room, slipped immediately, went head over heels and landed on my back and thought I was going to die, it hurt so bad, but I thought, well, okay, I was still alone in the room, here's an opportunity. So I struggled to my feet, and you have to see the body, body attitude. Waiting for the next guy. Just, just hanging out. Next guy comes in. Same thing. He sees me, because he was drawn into the room because I was being so casual. Unaware of the danger, he falls. So what do you think he does? The same thing, he stands up, he leans on the counter. Third guy comes in, he gets to the doorway, he looks at the two of us, he says, nah. <laughs> I'm not doing that. You people are evil. Danger in coworkers, but it's danger. There's danger of a lack of knowledge. Sometimes we don't see the danger. And we have to experience some sort of training. It's what it's what well, it's what old age gets you. You know you know where the rough spots are. You know that that's bad. I know that's bad because I've seen it before, or I just understand that generally this, this transpires and it's, it's not good. I was working with a man who was doing Eastern religion, meditation and uh, Buddhism, and we used to drive in the fire truck. I drove the one that drove at both ends, so you're hooked intercom-wise to the guy that's driving the back. Everybody goes into the market, and CJ and I are alone on the fire truck and he says you know I've been thinking about something I says what's that he says I've been thinking I'm growing so much spiritually that I've really grown beyond my wife so oh really and what do you say it's you know it's you know casual conversation he says yeah he says so I'm gonna go home and tell her that I'm gonna set her free think about that for a second <laughs> I said, CJ, Shakespeare said it absolutely correctly. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. And if I were you, once you announce your intentions, do not go to sleep. Because this girl's going to hurt you. <laughs> no one wants to be set free. That's the silliest thing I ever heard of, and I expressed that to him, but nonetheless. So here we are. First we talk about the metaphor is in body language. Walk, stand, sit. So it looks, like a, it looks like a metaphor based on ambulation. Walk, stand, sit. If you're doing sales, what are you looking for? You get traffic walking by. You wait for somebody to stop. If you're doing carnival, the person who stops can hear your spiel. So walk by, make them stand, make them look, cause them to stop, and in some cases sit and partake of whatever it is you have to sell. So what are the three groups that we walk, stand, and sit against or not to do? Wicked, sinners, and scoffers. So we've got two groups of three. We're going to merge them together and figure out where the danger is. Except that this is not ambulation. This has to do with attitude. Historically, not any of your history, but in back when I was young, uh, when dinosaurs roamed the land. So walk was a man's occupation. What's your walk? And I can't remember who it was that wrote the song, Walk of Life, but somewhere in the 80s or 90s, that was their, their uh, you know, rock music was, you know, do the walk of life. Well, what is your walk? Well, what do you do? What are you known for? Uh, last week in Sunday school, we were discussing how last names came about, you know, somebody's, you know, John's son, or Weaver, or uh, Smith. These were all occupations that you were named for, so you were, your, 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 uh, your name was, you know, Bill John's son, and you, you were the son of John. So, what is your walk? Or what is your walk not supposed to be? Well, it's not supposed to be in the counsel of the wicked. Well, who are the wicked? 
It's interesting that you think these are just duplications of the same word, wicked and sinners. Yeah, why? Why not? But this is, they're each different. And the, and the interesting thing is, is that the wicked are people that are judged to as, have, have done sinful things. We see this uh, definition of wicked when Abraham is talking to the Lord overlooking Sodom. And he says, do you think, and I'm paraphrasing obviously, uh, do you think that everybody down there is wicked? Meaning so vile that they need to be wiped off the face of the earth. What if I could find, I think he starts with 50. What if I could find 50? Would that, would that, uh, would that keep you, would that stay your hand? Okay, then, then he renegotiates, what about 20? What about 10? What about 5? And the Lord says, well, yeah, I would stay my hand for any of that group, knowing full well, as being, as being the Lord, that there isn't anybody in the town. Because when they actually reveal themselves, when the angels go and, and stay in Lot's house, the narrative is, is that all the men of the town surrounded Lot's house. Everybody was wicked. Everybody had demonstrated a sinful nature that was willing to sin repeatedly. And it's not the same word as they use for the next term. And this is stand in the way of sinners. Stand. Another word that we use rarely anymore in this society, but what's your stand on not swimming a half an hour after you eat? Where do you stand on a national pet as being groundhogs. Your stand is your belief foundationally. What do you establish as your foundation of belief in a subject? Do not stand in the way of sinners. Don't take your stand on those. And this is that, this is that definition that we've heard a lot from other pulpits is that this definition of sin is those that are off the mark. You know, I, I was told it was an archery term. I couldn't find a uh, backup for that. But nonetheless, not quite right. Not quite true. Not quite dead center. This is what sinners are. So don't take your stand on doctrines or policies or philosophies that are not directly in the bullseye. Don't take your stand in a place that gets you off. I don't remember when it was, but a 747, I don't even remember whose it was. It was an American airplane that did a stopover in Alaska and then was on its way to Japan. It stopped in Alaska because it didn't have enough fuel to make it to Japan. So it had to stop at the airport there and fuel up and then fly on. So while they were up near the, uh, the top of the earth, there needed to be an adjustment in their, in their GPS uh, a compass because there was always a slight difference in the magnetic uh, earth and as you, as you as you flew you you got incrementally off the guy doing the deed the guy doing the the uh, uh, the adjustment was off by a degree simple mistake one degree I mean what could that possibly do but in thousands of miles the airplane ended up flying over restricted Russian airspace and a plane full of people was shot down and killed into the North Sea because one degree. That's what this warning is. Don't be off. Don't be out of, don't be out of sync with, with what is true. But be right. Be accurate. Be on target. Final warning is sit. And this is exactly as it, as it seems, but it is don't be comfortable or don't be in the company of, or don't be in the, don't be okay with the conduct of scoffers. <laughs> it's a great, uh, the other word for scoffer, the other translation for scoffer is ambassador, which I find truly weird, but when you think about it, people are translating stuff when they do, it, when they do ambassadoring. They're, they're taking what, you're, what, what their commander says and they're giving it to the people that they're aiming at, the other country, and saying, this is what my boss means. 
we'd like to come together as, as a group and sign a treaty and this and that. So that's what ambassadors are for. So scoffers are interpreters. Don't sit with people who interpret incorrectly, who interpret wrong. We're still being off the mark, but we're being off the mark as a solid place. This is what I believe. This is where I stand. I stand in this, and I stand in it because uh, I, I really believe in it. I was approached by a man standing on Peace Pacific Coast Highway. Uh, we had just done a, a helicopter thing. We rescued a guy and put him in the helicopter, and they were gone, and we were all getting back into our fire trucks. And Lyle says to me, you got a minute? I says, yeah, absolutely. He says, our fire station, we were of different stations. He says, our fire station has an opening coming up. And I wondered if you had anybody to recommend. I could think of a lot of people. I said, yeah, I got some names. He says, I just got to make sure that you understand that it has to be the right kind of person. That's kind of shocked. What do you mean the right kind of person? And then it dawned on me. Everybody in his fire station was Caucasian. And Lyle was a bigot. And he wanted me to base my recommendation on somebody's skin color. So I went and grabbed Charles. Lyle had walked back to his fire truck. He was probably a block away. I screamed his name, Lyle, Lyle. He turns around. <laughs> Charlie said to me, what are you doing? I said, shut up. <laughs> Is this the man? Is this the kind of person that I don't want to recommend? Is this the guy? Charles says, what are you doing? It's, I'll explain in a minute. Hang on. And now while I was trying to, trying to hide, I said, no, no, no. Stand out in public and tell me that this is the man who you don't want me to stand behind. Because I'll tell you this in public. This man, I would let guard my children. This man, I would let guard my wife. This man has shown me quality, richness of character. This is someone that I would stand with. This is someone that I would rest in. This is someone that I would sit with. Scoffers would scoff about all kinds of things. Is the Bible really true? Eleanor, Eleanor and I were discussing last week where Cain got his wife. Uh, Scoffers would talk about a lot of things, whether Adam has a belly button. How can you believe in a God? I was listening to a testimony yesterday as a guy's getting ready to join the uh, Thousand Oaks Church, and he said that the man that led him to Christ has since left the worship of Jesus because he could not believe in a God that would allow people to suffer. Just didn't want to do it didn't believe that God had control over the world for the good of all who are called. Be careful of scoffers. Don't sit with them. Don't take your heart and let them see or let them influence you. If you do all of this, if you, do, if you avoid these three dangers, these three landmines, what do you get? It's a, it's a work reward excuse me as an Orthodox Presbyterian for using those words in worship, but nonetheless, if you do those things, you will be strengthened. Because your delight will be in the word of God. God promises to strengthen you if you delight in his word. This is the armor that you need. When Jesus was taken into the wilderness and tempted by the adversary, he used the word of God as a shield, as a buckler against evil. Meditate day and night. So last time we were here together on uh, the middle of uh, June, the middle of uh, Romans 9 through 21, uh, Romans 12, 9 through 21, it says that you should delight in the word of God. Now we're going to delight in prayer. As a servant of the living God, you have a limited number of things that are universally true for all of us. We talked about the body metaphor and the fact that not all of us are the same. Yesterday, I was listening to the testimony of three kids, 10, 11, and 13. My question to them when we were through with the salvation questions was, where do you see yourself 
serving in the body of Christ. What are you for? It was pretty cute. The 10 year old who was just a sweetie and she said, well, I listen well. <laughs> I said, well, let me explain to you where God can use that. The 11 year old said, I'm an organizer. He knew what he was for. He's supposed to fix stuff, get it straight, put it in boxes. I said, well, you already know where you're, what you're supposed to be doing, so have at it. And the 13 year old really didn't know. So I'm not sure. So I said, well, there are things that you need to do to just prepare yourself for service. And one of them is pray for everybody that you in contact with and read your scriptures so that God can give you illumination. So what do you get? You avoid the dangers. You duck the wicked, the sinners, and the scoffers. And you delight in the law of the Lord. You meditate on it day and night. It doesn't really allow you a lot of time to not meditate on it. It's either day or night. So in some point, you're meditating on the word of God. And generally, if it's, if it's light, you're meditating. If it's dark, you're meditating. So that's the 24 hours a day, 365. That's our job. What does it mean to meditate on the word of God? Do you lock yourself in a closet? How do you eat? How do you go to work? Well, I think it's just on your mind. You meditate on lots of stuff already. Got to mow the lawn, got to mow the lawn, got to mow the lawn. Got to call my mom. Don't forget to call your mom. So in that process, you got to think, what does God have for this scripture? What is it, what is it good? Like I said, I've been singing this scripture to myself for months now. And uh, does it, is it a miraculous, marvelous, amazing change? No. Does it defend us against the adversary? Yes. Because my God reminds me of himself through his word. I say, well, that's not right. I should, I, so when, when these, these temptations and others come to us, wicked sinners, scoffers, when these people come to us, are presented to us, given us in our path so that we have to walk around them. Proverbs talks about not even getting in the path of the, of the wicked. So it's in our way and we see it. And are we tempted to do something about that, something not right? Well, the word of God gives us power over those things. You get advantageously planted. Anybody who's done gardening knows that a well-watered place is a place that's advantageous. You wouldn't, I mean, we live in a desert, so you could plant things anywhere and without water, they're just going to shrivel up and die here in California. But if we lived in a place that had weather, you would plant somewhere where water was abundant. Uh, I follow a Christian farmer kid in, in Iowa. He plants corn. And I'm learning all about farming, which I had no idea how hard it was. Oh, my goodness. It just takes every day, all day, morning to night. So here it says that you will be planted. Who plants? Who plants you? If I was, in, uh, if I was still in high school Bible study, I would look over at Alex and he'd holler, Jesus, which is pretty much true. So God plants you in a spot that is good for you. You'll be productive, prosperous. Not like the wicked. The wicked have a similarity. Similarly, the wicked are like chaff. I don't think any of you have winnowed chaff in your life. Oh, wait. Sam, have you winnowed chaff? OK, good. So, <laughs> I was wrong. Some of you have winnowed chaff, but it's a very small number. Uh, so you take the grain, it has an outer husk that is not, of no value, and you, what they used to do in the Middle East is that they would take it and they would throw it in the air. And the breeze would flow through the, the grain and slough off the stuff that is unuseful and the heavier kernel would land back on the ground. Do that enough times and what you end up with is just the useful kernel. And the chaff is where? It's, it's gone that way. Of no value to anybody. It's not even good for uh, animal fodder because it has no nourishment. 
sinners will be separated from us like chaff. But there's the throwing in the air, and there's the constant work. It isn't as if it's just going to happen instantaneously. It's going to happen through a lot of effort by God to sift all of the rough stuff off of us, all of the fluffy stuff, all of the useless stuff. It's going to be taken off of us and let fly away, and we are going to be left with a kernel of value, something that is good and nourishing to the body of Christ. In all of this, my opinion is the greatest promise in this whole verse, this whole chapter in, in Psalms, is verse 6. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. What a benefit is that? The Lord knows us. I was with a man yesterday. Uh, I'm pretty sure he used to be a spy. Uh, he's joining the uh, Thousand Oaks Church. He's really brilliant and has a lot of problems with how well God knows him. He was quite honest about not happy with himself, not happy with the life that he's led before salvation, not pleased with the horrible backsliding he does. But there's more to the Lord knowing us and not judging us. The Lord knows everything about us. He knows exactly what I need. He knows exactly what's going to make me prosper. And he knows exactly what's going to make me better and successful. For those of you that are parents, you just guess, right? Nobody gave you a book. This is how you raise your child. You've given X number of kids. They're all completely different. You can't do one size fits all, so you just kind of make it up as you go. That one needs this. The three kids that I was with yesterday, the 10-year-old the was just a dear heart, somebody whose heart was so soft. And uh, uh, Caleb gave the kids each the same problem. You're presented with somebody who says that they're good enough to get into heaven. What do you say? The 10-year-old said, well, I'd explain to them that none of us are perfect, that there's problems in everybody, and that we need some sort of help, some sort of external care that the, that the Lord would provide us with the blood of Jesus to cause us to be acceptable into heaven. The 13-year-old said, yeah, you're sinful. You're an evil person. And God's judgment is on you hard. <laughs> Difference in personality, same family, same household. So God knows us truly and perfectly. And he knows us well enough to provide for us all that we need to be better at our job. And that's glorious. Where we run afoul is when we do not believe that our Father has this. If you're old enough to remember the first Superman movie, Nicole Kidman falls off the high rise, Christopher Reeves scoops her up midair, and he says, I've got you, Miss Lane. She says, who's got you? God says, I've got you. I know you. I believe in everything that you do in my name. And a lot of us have trouble with that. A lot of us have trouble believing that God has this, despite the terrible things that happen in our world. I was on the phone for a long time yesterday with a young man whose child has been removed for his home, from his home for abuse. His poor wife uh, lost her balance carrying the baby, uh, fell, and landed on the child on the coffee table. The doctor in the ER believed it was abuse and turned them in immediately for it. And now starts the nightmare that every parent thinks about, at least. DCFS has the child, and they're having trouble getting the boy back. So I talked with that dad, and I said, 
do you wonder what God has planned for you? He says, every day. He said, what if he never tells you? He said, I just serve. I got nothing else. I'm a sinner in the hands of God, and I must serve because that's what he tells me. And that's the position that we're all in. God knows us, asks us to serve him in the ways that he's already outlined. And not necessarily be able to know the outcome. Let me, uh, let me close this in a word of prayer. Oh, Lord God, I pray that you would cause us to be servants. That you would give us your strength through your word. That we might be true witnesses to the world and satisfactory in our service. Watch over our day. Cause it to bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, where are we? If you would all stand, please. Oh, no, don't stand. I, I took that back. Uh, we're going to do the deacon's offering. Stay seated until the last verse of uh, uh, 134. God will take care of you. the benediction from the scriptures uh, number six the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you the Lord lift his lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and all of God's people said Amen. all right